Good afternoon, friends, colleagues, distinguished guests, including all members of the community who are here today to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the birth of Fred Korematsu, a very important civil rights advocate. Mr. Korematsu was an ordinary person who acted in extraordinary ways because he saw a wrong and he was not going to let it pass. He showed, as he said, one person can make a difference, even if it takes 40 years. <laughs> In taking action, he has made the world a better place for all of us. On behalf of the Santa Clara County Superior Court, I am honored to welcome you here today to hear about the life and legacy of Fred Korematsu from Professor Margaret Russell a noted constitutional law professor from a great university, Santa Clara University School of Law. Thank you for agreeing to share your thoughts with us today, Professor. I am pleased to say that this is the fourth year that the court has sponsored a Fred Korematsu Day on his birthday, and I thank our Community Outreach Committee and its chair, Judge Julia Alagimento, and also Judge Roberta Hayashi, who have done so very much to make this wonderful event a reality every year. Well, I give my age away by saying this. I am sorry to say that when I was in grade school and even high school in the 60s and 70s, there really wasn't a curriculum that dealt with this very dark period in our country's history when we interned Japanese American citizens because of widespread unfounded fears. I share the sentiment voiced by Fred Korematsu that no one should ever be locked up because they share the same race, ethnicity, or religion as a spy or terrorist. If that principle was not learned from the internment of the Japanese Americans, then these are very dangerous times for our democracy. So again, welcome. I'd like to introduce at this point Judge Alojimento, Chair of our Community Outreach Committee, he will make the formal introductions of our guests and dignitaries. All right, welcome very, uh, to today's event. I want to remind everybody, just like Cord, if you can have your cell phones turned off. Uh, I also do want to let everyone know that today's event is being video recorded and portions may be broadcast. Um, we also are very fortunate to be able to offer MCLE uh, today for any attorneys, and I want to particularly thank the Filipino American Bar Association of Northern California for partnering with us uh, so that MCLE credit could be provided, um, both for the event we had last Saturday and today's event. We also uh, have arranged it so that judicial officers and retired judges uh, can also get judicial education credits. So that sign up is outside. If you haven't done it, please do that and pick up your certificate. Uh, I do want to welcome you on behalf of the Court Community Outreach Committee. Um, our goal on the Outreach Committee is really to be able to provide education and outreach uh, to the community on important issues that deal with the third branch of government um, and really be able to educate um, and expose people to that branch and other justice issues. We have a number of different events we do throughout the year, uh, including this uh, for the last four years, also Educators Day, Clergy Day, Constitution Day, Law Day, all the things that make sense for us to participate in. Um, we have a speaker's bureau to allow judges to go speak in the community, mock trials, and many, many more uh, events. This event is one that started four years ago, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that when I introduce uh, Judge Hayashi, but it really is uh, to her credit that we have this event and such a wonderful event planned for today. Um, we were able to uh, partner with our community partners to bring the, for, to recognize really today the Fred T. Korematsu Day of Civil Liberties and the Constitution. The partners who worked with us in planning this event are the Asian Law Alliance, the Council for American Islamic Relations, the Fred T. Korematsu Institute, and the Japanese American Museum of San Jose. These organizations have informational materials, you can see they're set up at the back there, um, that, and they would love to talk with you more and provide those materials uh, to show you the really amazing work that they are doing. This past Saturday, uh, 
we presented the first of two events to recognize Fred Korematsu, and that was at San Jose Historic Japantown, just a few blocks from here, um, and where there was a lively panel that was moderated by Robert Honda, who is here today, there you are, uh, and included <coughs> Karen Korematsu and Zara Bilu, who is um, a member of the Council for Az American Islamic Relations. The event was titled, Speaking Up, the legacy of Fred Korematsu for the 21st century. We are very pleased to welcome you this year to our second of those events. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce the people uh, who are here. I recognize uh, that actually I forgot two things. I have flyers over there. But I do also, just in terms of things the courts are doing, uh, because we have such a great representative from the community here, let you know we are also recruiting for the civil grand jury right now, um, which is an, uh, a really amazing opportunity if you are at all interested. There are flyers in the bag. Um, Judge Valencia is here and assisting with that somewhere. You could ask uh, him any questions or ask any member of the court about that if you are interested. All right, as uh, to today's event, uh, let me start with Richard Conda again. Uh, he is, I'm going to have to look and see, thank you, there we go, all right. Richard Kondo is the founding executive director of the Asian Law Alliance, has been recognized as an unsung hero by the Santa Clara County Bar Association and one of the leading civil rights attorneys in Silicon Valley. He was also a panelist on Saturday and he's been very involved in every year um, with this program as well. We really appreciate his involvement. Aggie Itamoto uh, is here from the board of the Japanese American, thank you, uh, Museum of San Jose, which is really, if you haven't been there, and I will uh, be ashamed to admit that until I first uh, met on this event, I had not been there. I think we are one of, tell me how many, it's very few in the United States, uh, Japanese American museums left. One of three? Four? Three. I think it's three in the whole United States, um, Japanese American museums, and we have an amazing one in San Jose. So if you have not been there, please go. The museum has a wealth of information about the history of Japanese Americans in Santa Clara Valley uh, and World War II removal and incarceration of Japanese Americans. Ahmad Rafiki uh, is here. Yes, thank you. Uh, he's a civil rights attorney and, and legal services coordinator for the Council of American Islamic Relations uh, and a member of the event planning committee. Aikshaya Natarajan is here. On, on, uh, on the way, I think, um, which is the administrator of the Fred T. Korematsu Institute. Karen Korematsu could not be here today, but she has attended many of these events. That's uh, Fred's daughter. She today is in Phoenix um, at the Arizona State Capitol where a state proclamation is being used to recognize the Fred T. Korematsu Day of Civil Liberties and the Constitution. We have a number of judges and retired judges here, so I'm not going to um, announce all of them, but if you could just raise your hand, I think. Welcome to all of the judicial officers. So for today's event, we are very honored to have P Professor Margaret Russell here with us today. She joins us from Santa Clara University School of Law, where she's taught constitutional law and civil procedure for well over 25 years. She is frequently quoted in the media, most recently in connection with the proposed limitation on birthright citizenship and the confirmation of Justice Kavanaugh. Last year, she served as the university's interim associate provost for diversity and inclusion, leading the work on recruitment, support, and retention of faculty of color at Santa Clara University. Professor Russell holds degrees from Princeton University and Stanford Law School, and has been an active uh, has been active as a scholar affiliated with the Marcullus Center for Applied Ethics, the Nation Center, and the Bannon Faculty Collaborative and the Center for Social Justice and Public Service. She is also the past president of the Faculty Senate of the University and served on the Faculty Affairs Committee from 2011 through 14. In 2014, Professor Russell was awarded a Fulbright Scholarship to study the role of trial and appellate court women judges in Tanzania. Sounds fascinating. Um, she is a member of the American Law Institute serves on the National Board of American Civil Liberties Union, and is the editor of the First Amendment Freedom of Assembly and Petition. She also serves on the National Board of the Princeton Alumni Corps and the board of the Ten, Ten Pai, sorry, I knew I was gonna mess that up, Tenpaiosin Project, 
uh, the Advisory Board of the Museum of African Diaspora and the Advisory Council of the Bay Area Lawyers Chapter of the American Constitution Society. Her, I think it just goes on and on. I really uh, do. She does such amazing work. Um, she's co-founder of the Equal Justice Society and the East Palo Alto Community Law Project. She's going to start the program in a couple minutes or in a moment, um, giving us some initial report uh, remarks. After that, she's going to be interviewed with, by Judge Roberta Hayashi. Judge Hayashi uh, is a member of the Courts Community Outreach Committee and was sworn in as a judge four years ago today, um, really because she wanted to honor um, the day that she became judge, Fred T. Korematsu Day of Civil Liberties and the Constitution, and just uh, highlight the importance of that day uh, for her personally and, of course, in the world of the law. Shortly thereafter, uh, she's known Aggie Edomoto uh, for a long time, and they started talking about how they could do something to really inform people about the history um, and how the court may be able to work with the Japanese American Museum of San Jose to be able to honor Fred Kormatsu's legacy. And I do want to just take this moment to say I appreciate very much that I was uh, thanked in, in doing this. I'm the chair of the committee, but this has really been Judge Hayashi's baby from the beginning. Um, and I'm, I'm really just thrilled that she did that. Literally, she came to the very first meeting, sat down, and said, I think we should do this. I said, I think it's a good idea, and she ran with it. She's so passionate about it, um, and really, all of the credit goes to her. I'm just here to announce her. So um, we really, really do thank her for her hard work, um, with, uh, and, and certainly um, from the very beginning, um, working with her good friend, Addie, and bringing this uh, to all of you. Judge Hayashi is a third generation Japanese American. She, her uh, personal histories of her father who was incarcerated at Tule Lake Camp and her mother who was a US citizen who survived the Hiroshima atomic bomb blast do play obviously a significant part in Roberta's commitment to the community outreach and education about the Japanese American experience. We are, as I indicated, we're going to start with initial uh, comments from Professor Russell, and then really we're going to move into Judge Hayashi doing kind of an interview. But if there are any questions that you would like to ask, um, I'll be kind of wandering around, just uh, let me know, and you can hand those to me, um, and we will, uh, if you write them on cards, we will make sure those are asked with whatever remaining time we have at the end. This time I would like to uh, invite uh, Professor Russell up to the stand for our initial comments. Thank you. Thank you very much and happy anniversary uh, and happy birthday to uh, Fred Korematsu. I wanted to just start with some informal remarks before we sit down for the Q&A and uh, talk a little bit about Fred Korematsu because I had the great honor of knowing him for the last 10 or 15 years of his life. Um, he, to me, is most famous, not for the case of Korematsu versus the United States, but for everything he did, really from the 1980s on, um, it, working on securing the, um, the reversal of his conviction and those of Gordon Hirabayashi <coughs> and Min Yasui, and his steadfast activism. I was, in the late 90s, um, very active with the ACLU of Northern California. We had honored Fred Korematsu uh, and Rosa Parks, actually, and have a great photo of the two of them together. And I realized, as we were honoring him, that he was, he was so enchanted and delighted to talk to people about the importance of civil liberties. He had a regular schedule of going to talk to especially young people, which he liked the most, but high schools, grade schools, colleges, universities, communities, in the ACLU, I marched beside him at different marches, and particularly after 9-11, when there was um, racial and religious profiling going on, he stepped forward and made sure that people understood that yes, it can happen again if we're not vigilant. So I just wanted to start by saying that. Um, I assume that almost everybody here uh, went to law school, and if you went to law school before the 1980s, when Fred Korematsu's quorum nobis petition was granted, then you probably had a very crabbed and 
probably brief coverage of Korematsu versus the United States, the US Supreme Court decision. My guess is that if you remember back, you might think, oh, I remember equal protection, strict scrutiny, suspect classification. Okay, next. That's exactly how it was taught in my <laughs> constitutional law class. Um, if you went to law school after the mid-1980s, you may not have learned very much more than that. But it is extraordinary that the case of Korematsu versus the United States um, so vilified and despised by civil liberties and civil rights activists would find its way, the name would find its way into the majority opinion in Trump versus Hawaii just this past year from the US Supreme Court. What is the resonance, what is the importance of this decision? It clearly goes beyond abstract dry doctrines of suspect classifications and strict scrutiny. Um, the reason why the quorum nobis uh, petition was filed in the 1980s in the court of Judge Marilyn Hall Patel in the Northern District of California is just to remind those of you who already know and let you know, because of a, a very diligent group um, of lawyers, mostly Asian American lawyers, um, I would start naming names, but I'm sure I'm gonna forget somebody on the team, but um, led by Dale Minami, and they were enterprising enough in working with a constitutional law scholar and historian, Peter Irons, in discovering that there had been actual lying before the Supreme Court from the Solicitor General's office. So there are many reasons to think that the 1940s decision of Korematsu was wrong in and of itself. But on top of that, it turns out that they were acting on information submitted to them by the government uh, and this was shown in Peter Iron's book, Justice at War, as well as in the Quorum Novus litigation. The Supreme Court in the 1940s was actually reviewing documents submitted by the US government, by the Department of Justice, that were altered, that falsely reflected that there was a threat um, of Japanese invasion on the West Coast. So, the fact that under Franklin Roosevelt's administration, you know, ex ex Executive Order 9066 was signed by him, a Supreme Court that included such later luminaries and civil liberties as Hugo Black, it was shocking to realize that the majority opinion in that case very summarily jumped from identifying racial classifications as suspect, therefore warranting strict scrutiny, they leapt from that to a determination that an entire class of people under strict scrutiny, an entire class of people without any kind of individual due process could be cabined, could be interned, could be subject to curfews, relocated. The reasoning of that majority opinion is atrocious. Um, there is a, a very vocal dissent saying that the precedent of Korematsu will lie around like a loaded gun for future generations. And part of me thinks that the recent mention of Korematsu in the majority opinion of Trump versus Hawaii was an attempt by the majority to, I think the best word I can think of is sugarcoat its majority opinion by saying, um, by preempting criticism that it was just like approving Japanese American internment. Uh, and we can talk more about the Trump versus Hawaii case. So, so back to Fred Korematsu. He lost a high profile, extremely important Supreme Court case in the 1940s. He was born and raised in Oakland, uh, lived in Oakland his whole life. Parents worked in a San Leandro nursery and had uh, emigrated in 1905 to the United States. And for him to live that long, serve his sentence, get out, he was a, a welder by training, and then essentially live the next 40 years uh, was a very, very heavy burden because he had been the one to come forward and say he wanted to challenge the attempt to, um, to incarcerate him. He raised kids. One of them, Karen Korematsu, also became a friend of ours at the ACLU, and she is really his foremost advocate for both him and his late wife, Catherine Korematsu. Um, their son, Ken Korematsu, 
related uh, when he was in high school. So this would have been before the night uh, before the 1980s. He related that he had been in school and the history class had been covering the Korematsu case. He came home and he said, have you ever heard anything about it? He did not know that his own father was the Korematsu in Korematsu versus US. The same thing happened to Karen Korematsu. Um, it was in part a desire to forget that ignominious decision, that defeat, that great defeat and um, affirmance of internment by the highest court in the land that Fred Korematsu decided not to tell his own children about the case that he had lost at the Supreme Court. So when the opportunity came up in the 80s to reopen the case, to present new evidence, to try to figure out just the legal tool, the writ of quorum nobis, in which they could proceed in district courts, at least, to get the individual convictions reversed. Um, it wasn't until then that Fred Korematsu really stepped into the limelight. He was a very funny person for anybody who met him. And um, I, I would like to thank him for realizing the close connection between what happened to him and um, Arab profiling after 9-11, Muslim profiling now, he passed away in 2005. The decision in Korematsu has not been formally overruled, even though the majority in Trump versus Hawaii last summer clearly said that it was wrong the day it was decided. It was not formally overruled. And what worries me, I think, um, and I don't think that I overthink or overworry this actually in 2019, is that some of the, the baggage and the justifications of Korematsu have not been overruled, not even in the court of history. Last week at the law school, um, we had a town hall on white nationalism that the students had taken upon themselves, of every student group that I know of, the Jewish law students, the black law students, um, the Middle Eastern law students, the Asian law students, and they had taken it on to speak the name of white nationalism, I think provoked by the Pittsburgh synagogue shooting. So they planned this town hall, and I realized that we are in 2019 with, a, uh, with an entirely new generation worried about, witnessing, hearing about white nationalism. And in fact, this event was trolled on social media beforehand with some threatening language to the extent that we actually decided it was important to call security to come to the event. Um, fortunately, it went, it went off very well. So white nationalism, the rise of hatred, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, racism, homophobia, they, they, are more, they seem more alive than ever, right? They have come to the surface. There are legal doctrines and legal decisions that are much more protective. So one question is, why does it still exist and what can we do about it? Um, and that's something that, that I hope you get a little chance to talk about today. The second um, is really what the role of the judiciary is and the role of lawyers in recognizing what separation of powers and checks and balances mean. The reason why Executive Order 9066 was able to be signed by President Roosevelt, kind of uh, marry a congressional um, rebuke, a lot of congressional support, and then before the U.S. Supreme Court be upheld was because no branch of government was questioning the other. Um, the, in, in fact, the, the main concern seemed to be arrogating to each branch as much power as possible, not looking at what the other branches are doing. I see a lot of that happening today, um, and that concerns me. There are assaults on judicial independence. There are, uh, is widespread criticism of rulings that are not popular. Um, there are threats of recalls. There are threats of not respecting the rule of law. All of this really worries me, and I think it does go back to the Korematsu lesson that when you're not vigilant, when the judicial branch does not exercise very, very carefully its power of review dispassionately, we can fall into assumptions and stereotypes um, that in this case lasted 40 years. So um, 
I'll save my other observations with Korematsu for our discussion, and I want to thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Professor Russell. Um, you touched on the fact that in the, 19, uh, the 1944 case, Korematsu versus United States, where the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of Executive Order 9066, um, that that case was a long time ago, yet in 2016, during the presidential campaign, we heard Executive Order 9066, we heard the Korematsu decision that validated, referred to as precedent uh, for what a president can do under his executive powers. Um, and, uh, you know, comments such as FDR did it right, things like that. Um, so, just talk for a moment, what exactly did the 1944 case do and what does it stand as precedent for in the 21st century? That last part is a, a, an interesting question. Okay, so what did the 1944 decision stand for? Um, I had said that, that uh, Fred Korematsu, he was, he was really just a, you know, all-American boy growing up in Oakland, going to, uh, I think, Castlemont High School. And when the internment order, um, that there were internment orders, relocation orders, and uh, curfew orders. But when the internment order um, came down, he actually uh, ran away. And he dis there's a, a great documentary called Of Civil Rights and Wrongs um, that actually walks you through the story. But he ran away from his family. He said, I'm splitting. I'm not going to do this. He actually had been working um, after having been rejected for uh, the US Navy. He had worked in a, a government shipyard and developed skills as a welder. Um, so he was. You know, in a sense, he was a very um, loyal, everyday American who realized, I'm not staying for this. This is really bad. So he told his parents. They said, okay, just take care. And he split. He got his, he got eye surgery, right, to make his eyes look less Asian. He uh, adopted a pseudonym, and he uh, was walking around with a pseudonym, and, um, and he was picked up and arrested, essentially. So. As a result of that, when he was in jail, um, he was visited by a lawyer from the ACLU named Ernest Bessig, who was the executive director, who talked to him about what had happened to him and the possibility of filing a legal challenge to the internment. And bravely, he agreed. I think the very much the, the drift of the country at that time was so xenophobic and so anti-Japanese that there were not a lot of people willing to speak out. Um, he was willing to speak out. So in litigating this up to the United States Supreme Court, um, he was not the uh, it, sort of the anonymous kind of test plaintiff. He was very much engaged in wanting to contest his conviction and contest contesting the idea that he, um, because of his Japanese ancestry, uh, I think he had never been to Japan, um, but even if he had, <laughs> because of his Japanese ancestry, would be considered to be uh, cattle, essentially, at the horse track. So before the United States Supreme Court, the question was, did the internment order, by singling out individuals of Japanese ancestry, um, did it comport with the Constitution under the highest level of scrutiny? called strict scrutiny. And in law school, you may remember, um, strict scrutiny is articulated, or just as judges, strict scrutiny is articulated as requiring whatever the government action is be justified by a compelling governmental interest, and that the law, the, what the means of carrying it out, is actually necessary. So when the court, um, the Supreme Court opinion, took on the question of uh, suspect classifications, and then the question, is there a compelling governmental interest? They said, yes, absolutely. Um, how do they know? Because there should be some uh, <clears throat> scrutiny of the government's motivations and proof. 
How do they know? Well, because the government told them. And this is a problem that still exists in national security rationales, is that if, the, if courts defer to the, uh, to the government, especially to the president, at times of, national, of, of war and national crisis, um, how is that deference compatible with the level of scrutiny that needs to happen to see if something goes behind it? So what Korematsu really stood for, ultimately, um, was that there could be a, uh, an internment, a racial classification or cabining of a group of people without any individual due process whatsoever that could be justified if, um, if the government, if the president, through an executive order said, national security requires it. And I think the thing that's uh, alarming about the particular statute that Fred Cormonson was convicted of was he was convicted of being just one eighth or more Japanese and remaining <coughs> in the relocation area, not leaving the relocation area under the custody of the U.S. Army. Um, and the statute itself made it illegal for any person who was one-eighth Japanese to enter the relocation area, remain in the relocation area, or leave the relocation area other than under the custody of the U.S. Army. So it was a no-win if you were simply Japanese-American in part and in those three states, you were violating the law. That's right. It's interesting that the fraction one eighth, <coughs> excuse me, also applies to Homer Plessy, um, who in 1896 was the individual one eighth black who was in the white, uh, and he was a deliberate um, test plane as well. Um, he was in the train car that was reserved for only whites and made it known that he was of mixed race. So, um, in just last year, Chief Justice Roberts wrote that Korematsu was gravely wrong, referring to the case, was gravely wrong the day it was decided, had been overruled in the court of history, and to be clear, has no place in the law under the Constitution. So, you just mentioned that you don't that's not a formal overruling of Although, four months. Although, if anyone in. wants to disagree with me, I'm, I'm happy to hear. There's no definitive answer, but constitutional law scholars say, well, it's a statement. That would be dictum, but so what it's does not it formally mean? overruled. Um, no. I, I mean, I think you would have to know or the clerk or the justices. But I surmise, based on the decision to put it in the opinion, and Justice Sotomayor's dissent, which strongly takes them to task in ways that I'll mention in a second. Um, I think it was raised enough in the briefs and in, in conference that in drafting the majority opinion, the court wanted to to ward off, you know, in this, I use the word sugar coat, but they wanted to ward off comparisons to Korematsu. Um, Scalia had, had actually said, I mean, it wasn't con controversial to say it was wrong the day it was decided, and in the court of history, um, it has been proven wrong. Um, many justices had individually said that, Scalia had said that, yet, as you mentioned, because it was not overruled, at times of national crisis after the terrorist attacks of 9-11. Suddenly, you see attention being paid in articles about um, the Justice Department looking at Korematsu and asking whether the idea of quarantining or uh, sequestering or even curfews was, was possible. So, um, so I think it's, it's significant that it's there in the majority opinion. Um, I, I certainly am thankful for it, right? <laughs> it's good that it's in there. It, it angered, I, very clearly, I just listened to her reading her dissent from the bench. She was angry. Justice Sotomayor said, you brought up Korematsu as being wrongly decided, but you're making just as big a mistake today. Um, in Trump versus Hawaii, the issue was uh, the travel ban and whether or not it discriminated with animus against Muslims. 
and the majority did not see it that way at all. They completely rejected any notion that it was religious discrimination. They um, rejected the notion that specific comments that Trump had made against Muslims should be taken into account in what was otherwise a, a rational um, power of the president at times of national security. Um, so when, when we look back at Trump versus Hawaii, I think what you'll see is not only this statement of rebuke that it was wrongly decided, but you will also see, I think, in Sotomayor's dissent, discussion of is the travel ban as bad as this? And she pointed out some aspects in which they were very similar, most notably deference at, in times of, um, of national security to the president. Uh, deferential power to the president can be seen as abdication of the power of judicial review. So you had mentioned the Ruth Corbinovas petition and um, Dale Manami, who was the lead attorney on that. And by the way, um, one of our colleagues on the bench in Alameda County, Dennis Hayashi, was one of the attorneys in that team, Don um, Tamaki, who was um, on the Corbinovas team and then, of course, was one of the attorneys um, on the amicus brief that was filed by uh, Karen Korematsu. Uh, and the others in, in Trump versus Y. But anyway, Dale Manami has mentioned that when they filed the writ of Coram Nobis, it was really their hope to be able to overtake the overturning of the convictions of Fred Korematsu um, all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court and to get a statement formally overturning the constitutionality of the statutes of the internment orders. Um, and they weren't able to do that. So is this statement, this dictum from J Chief Justice Roberts as good as it's ever been again? With this court, or do you mean never? <laughs> I'll, t I'll um, say. For, you know, I was just thinking back, I, I, I was just remembering that it didn't get up to the Supreme Court in large part because the government before Judge Patel, uh, as she said, their failure to respond to certain documents and arguments presented, Judge Patel said that is really tantamount to con confessing error. Yeah. And so they didn't fight it. And if they had fought it, let's hope that it would have been overturned. As far as going forward, so, the, the, the talismanic name of Korematsu versus the United States um, is, is overruled to the extent that a majority said it in the Trump versus Hawaii opinion. But that's not a fo formal overruling, nor is it an examination of the analysis of that question underlying the internment, right? There is reference to Korematsu as being wrongly decided. There is not a discussion of how uh, national security, which is a compelling governmental interest, should be shown in a way that would satisfy a court that it is not based on animus. And my hopes for the future, well, you know, don't hold your breath. For, um, <laughs> so not, but not let's hope there is not cause to revisit it. Well, I think we can all hope there's not cause to revisit it, but right. we'll see. So the majority decision, just quoting Justice Sotomayor's dissent, because she really said, and I mean, this is a, a really strong dissent. Did the major? She said the majority decision in Trump versus Hawaii redeployed the same dangerous logic underlying Korematsu and replaced one gravely wrong decision with another. Have you seen dissents that strong come in other circumstances? And, and what's your view of, of um, her comment? Are, was the majority redeploying the same logic used in Korematsu? 
Well, it's, it, they rely on a couple of different arguments. And, and the, you know, the statutory argument about whether or not this particular section of the statute allows the president to act in a certain way is part of their decision. They do address the, um, the religious discrimination argument and reject it by referring back to what they first said, which is that it's rational for the president to have this power under the statute. So in that sense, there is a, there's a disconnect, I guess you would call it, a disconnection in the two parts of the majority opinion because they, they give less than short shrift to evidence in the record that suggests that the president of the United States was motivated by animus, was motivated by having said negative things about Muslims, for example. And in the majority opinion, they, they look through it carefully and, and they just say, well, you know, it is true that these things were said before the election and they were on his website until several months after the election. Okay, now we've mentioned it. And then they just say, but, but we don't need to take that into account because the face of the order itself doesn't say we are keeping out Muslims. So I think, I think that is, you know, that is why Sotomayor's warning, I think, is is very powerful. You've had you've had the opportunity to know Fred Korematsu to talk with him. Um, Karen Korematsu uh, wrote uh, a letter to the editor in the New York that was published in the New York Times right after uh, Trump versus Hawaii. Um, came down, but from your view as a constitutional law scholar and someone who knows the law and someone who knew Fred, what do you think Fred Korematsu would say about Trump versus Hawaii? Well, I, I mean, I don't know for sure, but certainly the work that he did, particularly after 9-11, um, against the racial profiling uh, and religious profiling of Sikhs and Muslims, um, he was really steadfast in drawing parallels. That certainly makes me think that he would agree with those who called it not just a travel ban, but a sort of a disguised Muslim ban. Um, that much I would know for sure. I, um, Fred never got heavily into the reasoning, right? Because it was about his story and the logic of why it was wrong, not the, the legal language of strict scrutiny, et cetera. So I don't know. Um, I, I, I do know for sure that the heart of the travel ban, the comments against Muslims made, um, the, the fervor really whipped up um, in that whole run up to the election and afterwards lead, leading to the signing of the executive order. Um, I think that Fred Cormans has certainly would have been horrified. And I'm glad Karen, Karen's kind of carrying the torch for the next generation. So. Judge Patel, in her opinion, and we were fortunate to have her here with us last year. Oh, great. And um, so, and I asked her actually kind of the same question I'm gonna ask you. So, um, Judge Patel, when she granted Fred Korematsu's petition for rid of Coram Novus, um, she described the 1944 U.S. Supreme Court case as overturned in the court of history but still standing as a constant caution that in times of war or declared military necessity, our institutions must be vigilant in protecting constitutional guarantees. And it sounds like you agree with that. Yes, even with the Supreme Court's sentence in Trump versus Hawaii, I certainly agree with that. So as we sit here in 2019, what are the can you talk more about the lessons that we sort of learn when we look at the Korematsu cases bracketed by 1944 case on the one end and Trump versus Hawaii on the other? Um, well, that's a simple question. <laughs> uh, it's not at all. And Judge Patel's answer would have been, I agree with her, whatever she said. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so um, so what, what are the lessons learned? Well, well I meant, the reason I mentioned this um, town hall on white nationalism that the law students, who are not a radical bunch, I'll tell you. Santa Clara is not like Berkeley. You don't have a lot of rallies and protests. But, you know, but they're very thoughtful and they see the world around them. 
And because of that, they really made the decision to join together to send the message that really what, as King said, what happens to us happens to, what happens to them happens to us, happens to all of us. And that the, the rise in hate um, that really seems stirred up in this, is stirred up in this administration, for some people, um, a lot of people actually, turns them, you know, almost through unconscious bias, it, it turns them into the enemy, right? By skin color, by um, physical appearance, by the language they speak. And that is ratcheted up um, to such a high level that it resembles the hysteria that led to um, the internment of Japanese Americans. Um, perhaps because that would no longer fly um, as exactly as Executive Order 9066 did, there are other ways, you know, very sophisticated legal ways of cloaking that animus. And I think the, the travel ban by referring to the countries putting in some countries that are non-Muslim um, affords the government the argument that it's okay, that, oh, you're just imagining that, you're really not seeing the level of prejudice. Um, but, but a lot of these young people that I talk to um, from all different backgrounds definitely see it. I, mean, I live in the bubble of Oakland, so I don't see a whole lot, but I study it all the time, I read about it all the time. Thank you. At this time, I'm going to ask Judge Olajmeno if um, if she can sort of moderate if there are questions. Oh, good. Or comments. If anyone it's wants to say no, then Korematsu is overruled. True <laughs> or false. <laughs> All the judges in the room vote. Uh, so uh, we did receive one question that was written. And so there was some cards that were ha being handed out. But if you have any questions, um, of course, we can do this a little more casually as well. I can just bring the mic to you. I'll be kind of Anna White today. So, uh, but we did receive one, so I wanted to start with that. Uh, I know we we're talking a lot in this context about you know Trump versus Hawaii. But the question was, does Korematsu support President Trump's uh, invocation of national security in declaring an emergency for a border wall because the executive quote unquote says so? The, the, the first Korematsu reasoning doesn't support that argument. Well, now that the majority has said that, you know, don't use Korematsu anymore in, in making arguments for national security, it wouldn't literally do that. I think Korematsu will not be used as support. Um, and that is, that is a good thing about um, the majority in Trump versus Hawaii is mentioning it. However, as I said, the underpinnings that didn't get examined um, that have never been examined, that are very tough and thorny questions of separation of powers, respecting the power of the president in times of national emergency. Um, those have not been resolved at all with respect to race. Um, meaning, I think there is an answer to it, right, which to me has to do with individual rights and individual due process that is accorded to all of us. But the Supreme Court has not taken that on in a way that convinces me um, that they would reject a national security rationale for the border wall. All right, thank you. We just come over this way. Just pass the microphone to you. I think you can probably ask the question sure. yourself. So. Hey, uh, for I'm gonna actually, I will ask that you use the microphone just because sometimes the sticks in here. I think for anybody, and for judges and retired judges, the reference to legislative history is always perplexing. Uh, Justice Scalia and others say don't consider it. Sometimes we have an embossed legislative history, but it becomes problematic with one single chief executive <laughs> and the rise of social media. People torch each other all the time. It doesn't matter what the political leaning is. Left, right, in between, they'll say some outrageous things. Right. And so have civil libertarians focused on a unified theory of the use to which uh, statements uh, should be considered once an executive, for example, puts pen to ink and signs an executive order? And to what extent, I, I understand that advocates will do one thing or the other, but any unified approach to that perplexing issue? Well, I think there is a, a strong um, agreement that whereas legislative history is um, 
not useful many times in describing uh, an act of Congress or, or a law. As you pointed out, when you have one person who is very vociferously spoken on an issue about which he then takes you know, pen to paper and writes a, an executive order, that's, that's a shortcut of the mind right there in terms of knowing what that person has um, the intention of doing. Thank you. Are there questions or comments in the audience? I mean, we have just a wealth of information here, here so uh, we'd love uh, any questions or, or comments. All right, right here. Thank you. Um, I confess to not being a constitutional scholar. We don't get many of these cases in the Superior Court. But just reading quickly the mention of Korematsu um, by the majority, it, it seemed odd to me that they didn't, they write as though they weren't planning to mention it at all and say, in effect, well, since you brought up Korematsu, we're telling you it's, it's overruled. Is that how you read it, that they, they only were replying to the dissent? And what does that say about what they were trying to do by ruling on this and leaving Korematsu totally? Well, it, it, uh, I mean, you pointed it out. It is, it's very noteworthy. It was a head scratcher, even as people were waiting, you know, the live blogging from the court, reading the opinion from the bench. Uh, it's very odd, uh, and and I I think I mean, my own opinion, but I don't know why they put it in for sure. Is that it had been such a strong um, presence in the discussion and even the arguments in the amicus brief leading up to the decision in the case that they did throw it in. Um, and there are different ways of reading that. Some people might say, well, this is great because at least they said Korematsu. Uh, is wrong and was wrong the day it was decided, right? Which is just a way of really clearing the debts. Um, or there could be the more suspicious notion, which is, you know, you're doing this in order to distinguish upholding the ban uh, in the preliminary injunction challenge, upholding this. Um, and it's almost like a magician's sleight of hand, you know, it's like, this is not that. This is not Korematsu. Um, we don't like Korematsu. This is something else. And there are distinctions. I mean, you know, the Korematsu case orders had to do with people who were in the country. Um, there, there are definitely differences. The executive order had to do with people seeking to enter the country. That is a difference. That's why the Immigration and Naturalization Act and the president's power under it is an important part of the majority opinion. But the, the part of it that continues to trouble people is the religious discrimination part that was not adequately addressed. Any other questions, comments from the audience? So if I can just ask a question, we recently had a situation where there was a young boy uh, in the East Bay whose mother, and the young boy had a terminal illness. His mother was not being allowed to enter the United States because she was entering from Yemen. The child, who was a U.S. citizen, was here in the United States getting treatment up at, um, in Oakland, in fact, at, at Children's sure. Hospital, I believe. And uh, this whole, so how, how does this travel ban, if we say, well, it doesn't affect people, it only affects people trying to enter the country, well, what about this young U.S. citizen boy who wants to be reunited with his mother before he dies. Well, certainly, that, that is the case. I was um, mentioning just sort of the difference in what's in the language of the law, but you're absolutely right that mixed status families, um, which describe a, a lot of people, um, are facing um, incredible adversity because of this order. And was that an argument? I, I mean, I saw that there was an argument about it, and I think one of the dissents, um, and it may have been Justice Sotomayor's dissent, but it didn't seem to get addressed at all in the majority opinion. Oh, they don't care about that. <laughs> okay, that's terrible. I mean, no, they, that, it, the reason why they addressed the religion argument it was it was it, it was be caught, um, presented as a, as a constitutional question, and I think they really did don't care about 
the underlying harm. That's just not part of the discussion of this court. Hi, uh, I'm not a judge. I work at the Gourmet Institute, actually, so I'm very happy to be here. I did change. <laughs> um, well, so I'm very lucky to work for Karen Korematsu, and I hear um, Karen telling the story of her father's legacy and how that is currently her legacy today. And I hear her um, give really impassioned speeches to any and all um, audiences. And I think one of the most um, uh, notable quotes that she, that she talks about when referring to Trump v. Hawaii is that um, Chief Justice John Roberts replaced uh, one injustice with another, and really, she says often that he dishonored her father's memory. So I think that Trump v. Hawaii and other cases, you know, other civil rights cases are very, very um, relevant when discussing the legacy of Korematsu. But um, I guess my question is, I, I'm not familiar with constitutional law, or I mean, to the extent that you are, obviously, but um, from what, as a bystander that is interested in what the Supreme Court is doing, I see this really troubling trend, um, and maybe it's, I don't know how long this has been going for, I've noticed it for the past few years, that the Supreme Court really is passing the buck on a lot of really important um, civil, rights, civil rights issues that come up. And this is not, you know, not just with Trump v. Hawaii and other sorts of uh, cases like this, but in really in a lot of different cases. And I was wondering, what do you think is the kind of steps that we as citizens, as people that are interested, what are the kind of steps that we can take to, I don't know if the word is putting pressure on them, but to just generally demand more from the judicial branch in terms of being an active check on you know, civil rights injustices that the other branches of government seem to be kind of pushing them in one way or another and then they just kind of keep going. And maybe that's just me observing that, but I wanted to get your opinion. No, no, your observations are correct. And I guess I could say go to the state courts because the federal courts are, are not really a place that you can necessarily get justice. Um, the composition of the federal judiciary has changed quite a bit um, under this administration, beginning with Supreme Court appointments. And <clears throat> although some of my colleagues say, um, well, the court is gone, the door is closed, um, forget about it, the federal court, federal courts and the Supreme Court um, for this generation and maybe longer. Um, that's a hard branch to write off. Right, so I think probably shining a spotlight on, and in a way that non-lawyers, non-judges, lay people can um, readily see, shining a spotlight on the deficiencies in the court's reasoning, the way that it looks at race and voting rights and um, just a number of different issues that are coming up, at least that serves um, an educational function. As far as um, winning before the court, it's possible, but uh, uh, mostly um, ACLU lawyers, civil liberties and civil rights lawyers are figuring out how not to get to the US Supreme Court. Um, and the political branch, right? You certainly have seen a lot of energy around um, congressional races and the upcoming election. So the political branch is something that you can can count on. But I do agree with you that uh, the Supreme Court is you have you have several good people on the court, uh, and I'm glad they're staying on the court. But it's not a majority. Any other questions or comments from our audience? Okay. Hi, so the, the question that I have um, concerns national security. We've heard uh, Mr. Trump um, state in no uncertain terms that his option is to declare a national emergency and uh, use that as a, as a justification for getting funding and building the wall. And I'm, my question is, in Korematsu, was there any uh, discussion or was there any uh, uh, case law or precedent that sheds light on exactly what are the parameters 
of national security. We know in Korematsu there was a war, so they, it was a lot clearer in that uh, context. But uh, in this day, is, is there something that we can look towards in the Korematsu decision in their analysis as to uh, what national security is or similarly that would justify that kind of executive action? No, not in the Korematsu majority. And the, the whole question in, in a number of, in the line of cases about uh, the president's pa presidential power vis-a-vis -vis Congress um, is, a, is a thorny and much debated one. So in terms of having a clear answer where the power ends, um, we don't have that in case law. However, um, there is a lot. I mean, you may remember the Youngstown Steel case and Justice Jackson's famous concurrence that talks about um, how to evaluate conflicts between the president and Congress in terms of how far they can go. And, how far, and that was the seizure of the steel mills in that case. Um, there's a framework and there's, there's guidance. So if Trump um, does declare a national emergency and says, um, therefore, uh, I direct that a border wall be funded. The argument, I think, the best argument is Congress has the spending power, right? So whereas in a national emergency, you could say something like, even it's, though it's, you know, I don't think it's justifiable, you could say, here's your ban, right? Here are your restrictions at the border. For him to reach so far as to say, I'm going to order another branch of government to allocate funds for a border wall is, is clearly over the line. Clearly over the line. And I, I doubt that he would get a majority in, uh, to back him up at this point after the closure of the federal government for a couple of weeks. Other questions, comments? Okay, I know we're getting a little bit close to uh, people needing to get back to court with the number of judges here. So I want to, um, first, let's just give a round of applause. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I want to thank Judge Hayashi for the wonderful idea and implementation of this program, the program last Saturday as well. Um, and I want to thank all the partners that worked with the court on this program. I failed to mention at the beginning, um, I did mention there are materials back there, um, so please do take a quick visit since we're ending a few minutes early. We have um, representatives from CARE, Asian Law Alliance, and the Fred Korematsu Institute all back there with materials, which actually does also include, so I will mention it, um, the Presidio in San Francisco is having a pretty, easy, pretty amazing um, event. Uh, it looks like they have a number of different ex Expedition, exhibitions going on right now um, and through May 27th, but including a photo exhibition, which looks pretty amazing on the internment um, and different um, incarceration of Japanese Americans uh, during uh, World War II and uh, related to civil liberties. So I invite you to take a trip to San Francisco and look at that as well. Um, I think that probably uh, people can stick around too for maybe more casual question and answer for a few minutes. But yeah. Let me just make a plug for that book beside you. Oh, yeah, which someone you. gave me for my birthday. It's a children's book. Um, and I know Stan Yogi is one of the co-authors. Um, so if you have children or grandchildren or children that you love, give them the Fred Koromatsu story. And I'll make a plug on that for the judges in the room. We'll be doing Read Across America on March 4th, oh. where judges actually go out to elementary schools and read to the elementary students. And what a wonderful book, because we usually bring our own books um, and donate them to the school. So that's my, my own personal plug on an upcoming thing I'm going to ask you to do. Uh, so thank you again very much. Don't forget to sign in to get your MCLE or, or judicial credit as well. Thank you. Thank you.